There's one about the why is it dedicated to the Saint Holy Saint John? That I, I really don't. I know there's Saint yeah. John. If there's something that you don't want to there's answer, Saint John the Baptist and Saint John the Evangelist. Right. That's that's. I already have enough footage of the guys talking about that. Yes, yeah, so that part I, I've never got to that depth. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some things here that you know, mainstream. You know, all my years, I've never gotten that in depth in some things, mm -hmm. and some guys got more depth in that, and not so much into ritual. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's where where wherever it took him, you know. Um, well, I'm recording now, so uh, let me start by uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Mike. I am Mike Lenarski, Past Master Car for Lodge 2001. Did you also serve down in uh, Grand Lodge too? Or no, in no, I was in Scottish Right Line back in the 2000s, mid 2000s. Okay, I was there six years. So tell me about Freemasonry, Mike. What do you want to know? Well. An open question. Yeah, I know it is very open. Um, you have to be more specific. If someone came up on you in the street looking to inquire about it, like they just don't, they don't know what it is. What would you tell them? I'll tell them it's a secret society of men. There's a lot of good masonry. It all depends, you know. I mean, to me, to me, if you put your heart into masonry, it's, it's what it's all about. Some people join just to join, just to be say they're a mason. And never come back. Some people get involved and do good in it. And there's even guys that do get involved that don't intend to do good with it. You know, it's just like any organization. The problem with that is you got people involved and whatever. But, you know, I think back in its time, back in its day, you know, look at how many presidents were Masons. You know what I mean? George Washington, Harry Truman. The last sitting president was Gerald Ford. You know, since then, you really haven't had anybody. And, and, what I've seen in my, my journey, through my time in this 30, 38 years is, you know, when I got in in 79, that Masons were, uh, they, uh, what they did is they, uh, the, the World War II era, you know, the guys from World War II, they were very active and you learned a lot from them. Then you had the guys from the Vietnam era and the Korean era that taught them how to bond, you know, with men, where people were dependent, you know, helped each other and stuck with each other for a common goal. But what I see, and whether it's Mason or any fraternity, I really don't see that anymore. It's a different era, different generation, and it's, you know, what are they going to do for me? You know, back then, Mason wasn't like that, you know. You joined it because it was a very established and distinguished fraternity, and everybody, you know, was, you know, just said, hey, well, he's a Mason, you know, they're very, you know, very distinguished people in there, and, you know, this and that. But now I just, to me, I just don't, I don't see it that way anymore because, you know, the, the quality of people that are coming in really aren't stand-up people. You know, the, I mean, you, there's a few, but other, but nobody really joins with the fact like what it should be. You know what I mean? And I remember years ago when I was a young guy in, in Mason, there was no guy that would, T. Edgar Armstrong, he would take care of the widows. So every spring we'd go around, he'd get, say, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? 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 Because we used to meet on Friday. And he says, hey, meet me over here for breakfast. And then he'd say, hey, you and you, here, go take, go over here and take care of us. You know, what you do is them, back then, them, them, them widows, you would take the storm windows off and put the screens on. And then in the fall, you take the screens off and put the storm windows on. You know, and if their house needs some extra, you know, and he stayed in touch with them, if their house needs exterior painting, you'd go over there, he'd, he'd get the paint, and we'd paint it. But you don't see that anymore. You don't see that type of camaraderie or bondage that you saw back then. You just don't. I don't you know, it's sad. I mean, it's sad. You know, do you think that has something to do with the the quantity of masons, or do you think just the, the type just of think, people? Or maybe I think it's the people. I think it's the generations that just don't thrive on it anymore. You know, we're such a digital age too that everybody you know gets turns onto this. Nobody phone calls. Nobody no more. But then you know, what do you do to the old timers that don't have devices? You know, I mean, you send them an email. Email. Well, some of the old timers like to get stuff in the mail, or they like to be talked to. And we don't, you know. And I just see that you know people. This generation now of people coming in just, you know, they, they don't look at it that way. And they don't look at the, the guys that have been around and made it to what it was, you know what I mean? But that's just the way I feel about it. You know, that, that's me personally. And I feel bad because when I do see some of these old timers, you know, and, and a lot of guys have demitted out a lot of lottages. And they say, hey, you don't get no communications, you don't get this, you don't get nothing. You don't know what's going on, what the heck am I paying dues for? And I understand it. You know what I mean? And, and that's just the way they feel. All they want is my money. Yeah. But, you know, back then people got involved. You know, you had guys that would call. I mean, sick guys, you know, guys would go over and see each other. And, and you know, just, you know, they just did everything. But 
I think that was that 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 age of people then, and some of it did get get you know come down. But then after that, then the other guys just didn't want to, and you know, and the guys you know started just getting older. But then the younger guys didn't want to fool with it. I got time for that. So you know, I mean, so here's a widow that you know her husband was in a fraternity, and well, you just don't have time for her. You know what I mean? Well, I can say McKinley Lodge, what they do for their past masters, and widows thing is that they put uh, around Thanksgiving and that they make baskets of fruit and food and stuff, and they take them to the widows. That's I think that's another lodge that still does that. And I don't see anybody else really doing that. But that's just the way you know Bob Bruner and some of them guys there are still keep that. And that's what they've done for years, so they still keep that in there. You know what I mean? So that's just my theory of it. We could actually talk a lot about different things you said just from that first response. Um, and I kind of want to divert from some of my regular questions to ask you something else that it kind of reminds me of. So as far as direction on where some of these uh, the current Masons go, whether they're young or old, they're Masons. So do you think... Uh, Maybe some some word from the top, whether it's the the state grand lodges or grand lodge of England, should maybe kind of give, give some incentive to to change the direction a little bit or kind of right the ship. The thing seemed a little bit uh kind of independent, and you just I, I don't know that there's uh everybody's doing their own thing. Or what do you think about that? Well, for my years in this period, the grand lodges they were kind of gone off and and gone on their own path. From what they were, you know what I mean. So, they've they've gone off and and made themselves to almost a corporation now. You know what I mean. And they're getting bigger, and and all they care about is membership. I do, I really don't think the Grand Lodge now even cares about the quantity or quality of what masonry is. They just want members because they want the per capita, and they want, in my personal opinion, the money. That's it is what it is. You know, and I think in Illinois now their Grand Line they they go up every two years, not every year. So Grand Master in Illinois, he's there for two years instead of one year. So I think they're 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 looking at it a little differently than than you know this is the way it's always been here in the snap. But no, I you know either way. So the people that you get in there, and then you got to understand once you get down there, there's a lot of people that are going to buck the system down there too. You know what I mean? But I think I think if you want to make your lodge or any lodge the premier lodge, it's to the the members of that lodge and the officers of that lodge that are going to make it you know what i mean because the officers and i'm sure in your short time you've gone around you seen can either make a lodge or break a lodge and look at how many rituals or degree work you saw where they stumbled all over themselves i think that's pathetic don't you when you you're there for the candidate guy coming in don't you want to put on a class degree a class act letter perfect spot on everything when you're stumbling around you know, that just irritates me. But to these guys, it doesn't bother them. They're like, ha, 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 laugh it off. Really? You know, back in the old day, that never stood. It just wasn't. Everybody was, you know, when I remember when I went through whatever, I thought those guys were reading stuff, and then as, and then when I found out, whatever, I said, holy smoke, I was impressed that they could remember all that. But I don't think that type of inspiration is with people anymore. So, you know, like I said, I honestly think some guys just join. The people that join, join it for other things. You know, I don't think they look join it for what... The common good that they can do, what it's really all about. I don't know if I have a question for this, but uh, I'm curious. Um, let's see where this is going to go. Well, what, I mean, being that you have some qualms, either or whether it's nostalgic or whether you think, you know, things have kind of decayed from, from a, a grand era of masonry, which you, you respected the most, what keeps you in it? <laughs> well, when, you know, just, I don't know. I've been, I enjoy it for what it is. I enjoy when I meet, go to other lodges, and I see guys that are my age or a little older that believe in the values of masonry like I believe in it. You know what I mean? And and, and there's a few of them out there. And I see, and then the, the, the bonds you make through the years with other, other lodges and other, other brother masons. And, you know, and, and you seem involved and you, you, you get with them. And I mean, that's like a kind of bond that see a lot of these younger guys don't understand. You know, just like there's a guy that's a retired iron worker, Frank Frank, uh, Frank Sikowski. You know, he's from McKinley Lodge now. You know, he's all crippled up. He's in a wheelchair. And me and Bob Bruner or Elmer Simpson, them guys, you know, he lives by himself and he's in nursing home. We go and we see him and talk to him. You know, but he's lonely. But, you know, when he goes there, he likes to talk about masonry. 
And I mean, that's what drives me then. You know, here's this, this gentleman that whatever, and I worked on jobs with him, and he's a great guy, and, you know, and, and you know, this is what we talk about. And we, and we kind of talk about the, the, the past days of Mason, too. You know what I mean? That's what, like, you know, keeps him going. Like I said, when I would go to some, years ago, when I would go to some old-timers' houses, you know, that were around, and, you know, they, they'd want to talk about Mason, about the lodge, what's going on, this and that, you know? And, you know, they, they used to send out a letter, uh, like a newsletter, and I don't know if it was, you know, Lodge of Scottish Rite when I was involved one time, but this one guy, uh, Pete Bradle, he was a great guy. He lived by my mother-in-law's house, so I'd always go and see old Pete. He was a good dude, funny old guy. And he knew Gary Tap, me and Gary Tapley. He said, hey, hey, look, and I got the newsletter. He said, yeah, you and Tapley, I saw your pictures in it, you know. And there he was by his little table, and there was his newsletter. And then he had something from the Lodge. I mean, and that's what that was their life, because that's how much they expounded on Mason. We thought how great it was. So I got inspiration from that, and I just shake my head when I see people coming in and or lodges work, like I said, guys that just stumble over the ritual work and don't care, and so I just shake my head. And so it, within time, that lodge will probably be extinct. You know, if they have money or they don't have money, they're going to be extinct because nobody if nobody cares to put, push that tradition on and that type of work. It's tough, you know what I mean? And that, 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 that's where I see it headed, in my opinion. You know, I have some opinions on that to, to come back with you, almost to interview myself in a way. I think that uh, <clears throat> for... For an organization that prides itself on its uh, infrastructure of not only like of thought, but of of yourself and the way you you know you you work and the way you think, you know everything kind of seems to come at, at a value of, of the core of the man. And if that at that core of the person, if you're not correct here, just as like a, a building, you know, there's so many different references to Solomon's Temple, etc., architecture. That if you have any kind of cracks within you and at its core, then everything else will kind of crumble or collapse or be weak and eventually sure. collapse. So in a way, it, the masonry has, from what I've seen, some some of its own cracks at its core. Sure. And I think because it's drawing or, or it's trying to draw more members in just to, to keep things kind of churning and keep right. the machine going, that it's... It, it, it's got two major problems with that. I mean, you're you're attracting people for the wrong reasons, right. and those people are going to come in for the wrong reasons. Sure. And you're not, you're also not projecting and attracting the right people to come in there anyway, because, oh, like, you can't just say, well, you know, you could say the, the simple cliches makes a good man better, whatever, right. um, whatever you want to do to bring one in. The whole the marketing campaign of you want to you want to be one, ask one. Right. All, it's it's so superficial and not very. Uh, not very well thought out, in my opinion. If you really want someone to be in Mason, you have to really impress them and inspire them and encourage them in a way where you're like, well, take, for example, just social interaction. You know, you and I know each other because of Masonry. Right. And I'm sure that we'll become further friends as we right. get to know each other and, and get and learn from each other. Now, uh, when you, you go through schooling or when you go through careers, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're funneled through either age group or you're funneled through the type of work that you do. And sometimes you only have so many people that you work with. So you're kind of, you're limiting your amount of human interaction and you're limiting the amount of different kind of people you could possibly have a conversation with or learn from. Right. So I think what Masonry should be doing is saying like, here's me and here's Mike Wynarski, two guys that walk completely different paths of life, but now have found a common bond in Masonry and now can learn from each other and, not only do you, as a young man, you learn, but I'm sure you might learn something from me. Sure. Good luck, but you might get something. Well, out. I, I think everything in life, you, you learn something from everybody, no matter what. And even your kids, you know, I mean, you know, life is, life is always a learning stage. Every day of life is learning something different and something new. And it's just, that's just the way life is. I mean, if you quit learning, if you don't want it, then you don't want to learn. You're a useless member of society, you know, just think about it. But there's always something, you know, like they say, you can teach an old dog new tricks, and that's that's that is true in life. But you know, I understand. Just like you came through, you could have went through the one, the grandmaster's one day class, and what what would you really benefit out of it? Think about it. Your third your your third degree, you never would have got the the second part. You never got what you got, and you'll remember that, right? Well, the grandmaster's class is one day you just sit there and you watch it all, and you just like over there. But they do do the, do the stuff. You just sit up there and you watch it. That's how you partake in it. So, what are you really getting out of it? But let's run them in. You know, it was nice when it happened. I think in the two thousands, a couple of grandmasters. Oh, let's do it, and then and then everybody went on a stupid tangent. Oh, look at Ohio. Oh, look at Ohio. They got ten thousand masons. 
Okay, that was one time. Have they gotten 10,000 men every year? And what is their, the, the, what is the retention rate? You see what I'm saying? Nobody looks at that part. They just think, oh, God, look, we can. And then, and then, it's, just, and then it's just got the number. And then, then, well, hey, let's run them through Blue Lodge. Let's run them through Scottish Rite. And Shrine, too, all in one day. What do you, what, what is the individual getting out of it? Other than paying out 400 bucks for the day and getting a meal. You know? I just don't, I just don't, to me, that, that was ignorant, totally ignorant, you know. Yeah, it sounds like you run, uh, you and I have the same opinion on the, the subject. And right. this, if they want this fraternity to continue to thrive, right. they need to go back to the real benefits of it. Right. And that will attract real people that are actually interested in it and not just there for a label or a title. But, but, then, I, but then I think you go back to society. You know, if you, you look back, go to a lot of these old lodges, you look at some things back in the, in the 1930s and 40s. And, you know, everybody came to the lodge, they had a suit. Now you see guys don't even do that. They come in blue jeans or whatever. It's like, really? You know, at least come in a jacket, a sports coat, not a blue jeans. You know, not a pair of boots or whatever, really. But, I mean, that's how prestigious it was. So, I mean, if you look at that, it's almost like the generations, okay, yeah, I'm here. I mean, about four years ago, I was in Lodge, and a guy came in a pair of sandals and shorts and a T-shirt. Really? What did you bother coming for? You know, when I go to Lodge, I try to dress well, especially yeah. during degrees. Right. And I don't do that because someone told me to do that. I do that out of respect for myself. Right. And for the, the and that's person going to right. agree. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I completely understand that there's guys that have been around for quite some time. And as far as I'm concerned, they've earned their rights and stripes to do whatever dress, however they want. Um, <clears throat> candidates might not understand that. Right. You know, they, they might eventually get it. Like, okay, this guy went through a lot, and he's learned a lot, and sure. he can do whatever the hell he wants. He's pretty much the king of the lodge. Right. Um, so I, I completely understand that side of it. I mean, for, for younger guys or, or, you know, fairly young masons, or, or at least not necessarily young as far as how long they've been in Lodge, but maybe their accomplishments in masonry, I would say, like, you know, until you've you've proven yourself, that uh, then you can start up screwing around a little bit more. Well, I think you look at, you you know, you look at that, you were at Whiting Lodge with us, you look at the senior warden there. I mean, that guy was an officer, and what did he have? Just a shirt and slacks on. He didn't have no tie, no nothing, didn't have his tux or nothing on, really. And then he sat there like he was at home in, in, in his chair, in his lounge chair, you know, like like somebody told me, so why don't we just give that guy the remote and a, and a can of beer and he'll be at home. Really? I mean, that's sad. You know, you're there for a reason. If you don't want to be there, then move on. Move on, dude. You know, and I understand it's a big commitment. It takes a lot of time. And then that, what gets me, though, which sickens me is when I hear people say, oh, I got kids. Well, you know what? When I, My kids were small when I went through that line. And you know what? When Gary Tapp and those other guys, when they went through that line, their kids were just as small as mine. So you know, don't I don't want to hear your pathetic excuses. You know, because to me, it's bullshit. Yeah, I, I try to juggle my life, my my right. job, my modern technological, you know, distractions and obligations, children, and everything else. Right. You know, and I I find I find a way to make myself work. And, and get through it without being too much of a burden on my family. So it can be done. Right. And, uh, and I think if, if it takes longer for you to achieve, either whether it's degrees or learning things, right. you can explain that to you, either your mentors or your, your master of your but lodge. See, but see, here's the thing. Find a way around that. You're not a line officer. When you're an officer, it's a different thing. That's true, too. You see what I'm saying? When you when you go in that line, you took that responsibility. So when I, I hear from line officers, oh, you know, my kids got this, my kid, you know, no, you know, so do my kids. But, you know, really stuck, stunk with Garville is we every Friday night. That was the worst part. You know, the other, other ones during the week ain't bad. But a Friday night, you want to go somewhere on the weekend? Really? But, you know, when, when you're just a you know, guy, you know, come here and there, that's fine. But when you want to be a line officer, that's different. You have responsibilities. You have to be there. One reason I'm not an officer right now is I can't, I can't give... Devote the time. Right. I know uh, ahead of time that it's going to be more responsibility that I, right. I might have at times where I might not be able to make it or something might happen, right. and I don't want to put the, the lodge or, or anybody in, in any right. kind of position to, because of my, you know, right. whatever it right. is. Yeah, so. That's right. And I understand that. And, and that's the way it should be with anybody. You know what I mean? That's why I say it. Yeah. You know. Well, let's move on. That was a good start. 
I do want to ask you this. I mean, you don't have to talk too much about it if you don't want to. But uh, what is a past master and are you one? There's no past master. Past master basically is, is the guy that gets in line. <clears throat> Lines used to be like to go to get to the east. It used to be seven to six, seven, eight years because you start out a chaplain and you moved up. But if you've been in line, you know, if you've been in lots for quite a while and you were, you know, pretty good in some ritual but didn't get involved, you know, then they might slot you in like senior deacon, junior deacon, stuff like that. You know what I mean? And then like somebody, you, like me or whatever, I wasn't in there and, and I was been around but been shown up, they might slot you in like a, a junior warden station. You know what I mean? I mean, not a junior warden, a steward station, something like that. So, you know, it's just like that. And a past master then, you, you, you know, it's just been nostalgically through the years that, you know, you're the master lodge, and then you accomplish that, and that's why they call you the past master. It's kind of a thing that you you earned in masonry that is kind of cherishable. You know, like like Harry S. Truman, he was a past master, President Truman. You know, and there's a lodge down in Southern Indiana, Harry S. Truman Lodge. You know, when he was run, when he was president, whatever he came through there, and he 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 opened the lodge and obligated and everything down there back down somewhere down in Southern Indiana, and everybody just said it was so cool. You know, from the rumors I hear, you know, stories. But, you know, it's just something that kind of, it's kind of prestigious in masonry being a past master, you know, and, and, you know, I think when you, when you're in the East, you, you've earned that title and you should conduct yourself as, you know, as such, like up, just an upright mason, you know what I mean? Would you like to discuss your masonic journey, whether it's, you know, how long you've been in masonry or the different appended bodies you've been in or just anything in, Along the whole way, well, you know, I've been in for thirty-eight years. I was came in in seventy-nine. Was raised in December seventy-nine, and you know, and you know, when I was young, I was like twenty-one at the time, and you know, I got came in this and that, and then I was working and doing stuff, and you know, and it, you know, it was good, but like I said, it stunk about it. it was pretty nice, but you know, and then you got involved, and then I, uh, then I got busy working and stuff and this and that, and then I got back into it, and then when I got back into it, then I was asked to go in line, and then I got in line and. My kids were small, but, you know, I did it. But then I got involved in Scottish Rite, and I said, but the main thing in Masonry, there would be no Scottish Rite. There would be no York Rite. There would be no Tall Cedars. There would be no Shrine if it was not for a Blue Lodge. That's the mother of all lodges. You know what I mean? And, you know, that's the main route. And for you to go off, for anybody just to sit, not not to get in, but say, hey, I joined, I joined Masonry just to be a, a part of the Shrine. Well, that's kind of ignorant. You know what I mean? To me. Or just to go with Scottish Rite, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you know, they all have their own things, supposedly, but they're all spin-offs of the Blue Lodge. Supposedly they give you more. Well, if there was more, then why would Blue Lodge give you more? You see what I'm saying? That's, but that's the way I personally feel about it. You know, I was involved, like I said, in Scottish Rite for six years. You know, we did some degrees, it was fun and this and that, but then after a while you start seeing things and you start thinking, you know, it's just, what does this have to do with Blue Lodge? You know what I mean? It's just like another pennant body to me. And another organization that you're paying dues to you know what has masonry done for you as a man an employee and as a philosopher well i think as a man it makes you you know if you follow the, the beliefs of it and what it instrides in you I, I honestly think it does make you a better person you know because it helps you look out for your fellow man you know and and your fellow being really more than anything, you know, and, and to, to be courteous and kind to people is what it does, you know, and, and if you don't believe the, and those I believe are the main principles. And I, if you don't follow those or believe in those, then you have no business being in the lodge, you know, and uh, what was the other, the other questions? An employee and as a philosopher. What do you mean employee? You know, did, did you think it affects your work, that work ethic at all? Well, or, or, I mean, I know I it takes time away from your life, so no, that could affect your job. No, it did. What it, what it, was, what it did, what, what it did in, in work well when I worked in the trades. And even when I was on the Gary Police Department, there were brother masons that were there. And, you know, he kind of got along, and there were, there were some Prince Hall masons, too. And, you know, it just, you find out what it's about, because even then, even though they're not in your lodge, but they're, they're, they belong to the fraternity, they kind of, everybody kind of bonds and, and looks out for each other. You know, and then when I when I was in construction too, you know, like Bob Bruner, a lot of these guys, when you get on jobs, it makes the, it would make it more funner. You know, we're all masons; we'd all have fun, but we all got the work done. You know, hey, hey, you know, hey, I need a, hey, I need this. Can you do me a favor? Can you, can I get the rig? Can I do this? You know, just certain things, construction, and everybody wanted to, they wanted to help you out because it was part of the thing. You know what I mean? So nobody says, hey, get away from me, or you know, go go fly a kite. I mean, it just 
you just had so much commodity that everybody it just it, even after lodge it's still falling on outside you know what i mean the, the brother part of it you know just like your siblings or whatever you know you say hey what's up you know this that's kind of what it was and that's what i enjoyed about it you know and i've been you know worked a lot of different places and different things and it's kind of neat when you meet brother masons and you start talking and yakking and this and that and, you know and you know, I know guys that were from out of town, they would come along and find out and whatever, and they'd always come to you for, hey, what's a good place to go here? What's a good place to eat? You know, they, they'd just ask you, they didn't know. And, you know, if you could help them out, you help them out. That's what it's all about. You know, and I've been to different different states and, and stuff, and you go in there and you meet different masons. It's kind of interesting, you know. That's what's neat about it. And I remember one time we did a degree at McKinley, and the guy was traveling from Ohio, coming through, and came to the Master Mason degree, and I did the third tour, and third rough and part and he liked that and he said that's the best one he's ever saw in his whole life <laughs> and he was glad he stopped so you know it's just it's just you know if you believe in it what it's about the principles in your life and you know your life will move forward with it that's my opinion but as a philosopher i don't know if you're a deep thinker or not but you does it affect the way you think or think about things no not really i don't believe that part i don't believe it does for me you know at the point you know i mean because a lot of stuff you just you know you know, I, I think it's just, to me, I think about other things, what's going on in my life, and just, you know, problems, whether anything financial stuff, but, you know, I think just, and the, the other two parts, yeah, it does, but the thinking, maybe a little bit, but not, you know, not as much as what, you know, when you converse and deal with other people, you know, and I think even when I was in law enforcement, you know, it makes you better to, to deal with other people, to understand that, you know, that you're not there to demoralize people. You know what I mean? They're they're just like you, a man, just like you, whether they're mason or not. But they're a human being, you know. And you know, who are you to belittle people? You know what I mean? Because I see too much of that going on now, and it's just sad. But it is what it is, you know. Do you study anything in your free time, whether it's masonry, not masonry? Do you have any t the things you like to read? No, uh, no, not really. I'm, I, I mean, I'm just a busy person now. Even retired, more busier now. You know, always on the go. But, you know, sometimes I'll get some masonry stuff and, like, ritual work and go through it, practice up. I learned, learned the funeral ritual thing and stuff like that, you know, and read up and memorized that. And, you know, but as far as getting into it and reading these archives and all these other things, I think it's even you could look in your lodge's archives and go back and see things. And, you know, when you can get archives from the 1930s and 40s, you know, I got that de that desk just sitting out there. When, when the shrine moved out of Hammond, you know, we used to be in Hammond Temple years ago when we were there. And I found I found ledgers and, and the books in there from the 1920s. I mean, they just upped and left. And people, I said, wow, look at this history here that they just left. You know, and I was looking through and you see some of these people, some of these names like, wow, you know. and Just need to go back then and, and just look at that. And then I took it and gave it to the people. I said, here, here, this is what it was. I can't, I can't believe that you, you clowns left it, but you did. I mean, it was ignorant. Oh, yeah, 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 we did. Yeah, well, whatever. So you see what I'm saying? When you look at your archives or whatever, you should never lose that. And that's just and that just comes out of sloppiness, in my opinion. You know? <clears throat> Is there any life experienced wisdom that you would like to impart to any younger generations? Well, you can impart the wisdom, but I don't know if they will follow it because everybody, some of the younger generation has their own mindset and their own thinking. And I see when I even go visit some of these lodges and, you know, when you see some of these line officers, they sit there and they cross their legs and you say, no, you shouldn't do that. Why? Well, because it's the way it is. We've never done it. It's always fun upon it. Well, I'm going to do it. You know, I mean, so just, well, that's what you want to do. Fine then. I just think it's sad, you know, it just is. And then you see other old timers and one time when we did that, the uh, one thing over at Harbor Lodge when Rick Ellen was there and his dad was there, and then one guy walked in with a pair of jeans and whatever and hit and Rick's dead and he's got a sixty year pin, he was just chewing on my ear, look at that guy, look at that guy, you believe that bum coming in here, that bum can't even get a tie or a jacket and that bum, you know. But see that's old time, that's the way he is. And I understand that, and that's the way it was. You know, so, I mean, I just, you know, what wisdom are you going to sell them? They're going to believe what they want to do and do what they want to do. You know, and then they'll say, well, hey, this is a voluntary thing. I don't have to come here. So, you know, I mean, I mean, why beat a dead horse in the ground? It ain't even worth it, in my opinion. You know, it just shows me what kind of person they really are. Let me give you another side part of that question since, you know, I can completely understand that, you know, you can, 
you could tell anybody any number right. of things, whether no matter what age they are, and they're going to listen to you or they're not. Most right. likely, probably won't. If someone came to you and said, you know, teach me something, what would you teach them, or or tell me something? Well, it all depends on what they want to learn. I mean, that's just like, uh, you know, uh, when Matthew was doing a, a junior steward position, whatever at Lake Lodge or one lodge or some lodge, and afterwards I told him, I says, man, I said, you got to carry that staff better. You can't carry that thing like that. And he goes, well, show me. So I showed him. And I says, I carry it. And this is what you do. It's a tool of authority, and this is what you do. You just don't walk around like this with it. And I mean, you know, then he, you know, see, there's, there's, there's some guys like him. Even though he's a knucklehead, there's him, there's you, and there's a few young guys that want to learn. And there's this guy Jack Bertillo. He's out of McKinley Lodge. He, you know, he wants to learn. And you, you give him, you give him good wholesome instruction for their labor, and and they follow it. And then you have other people that could care less, like Tim Carroll. You know, there's a guy that could care less. I mean, how many people have told him and this and that? And he says, okay, okay, and he doesn't care. You know, so what do you do? You know what I mean? I mean, if somebody's wanting to learn, if somebody's eager enough and they want to learn, yeah, you don't mind helping them. But when they don't care, where should I care? You know, you're just wasting your breath. And my position, my feeling is they shouldn't even be in that position then. You know what I mean? You want to talk about your relationships and bonds with your old and younger brethren? Mason specifically? Well, you know, a lot of the old ones from my lodge, well, you know, there's a few, but I mean, the old old timers, a lot of them passed away. Uh, you know, me and Gary Tapley got, I'd known him for 38 years. Me and him get along real good. You know, I've known Bobby Bruner and a lot of these guys, you know, they're just, you know, they're good people. You know, they call up and, yeah, I got on the phone, check on this guy, check on this one, you know, and hey, I got this going on. And, you know, you come by and you give him a hand or go over there, or whatever, socialize. And I, yeah, I mean, it's just, to me, that's what it's about. And, some of the younger guys, some of the younger people or newer people, you really don't see it that much anymore. You know what I mean? Because I, I think just the way they're, they're lying, you know, and, and, you know, like somebody said, you know, I was reading a thing, whatever, somewhere and somebody says, you know what, uh, you know, I got down, I was sitting down watching TV, had a bottle of wine and this and that. And all of a sudden my phone rings and I look at some, some telemarketer cause from out of state. And then the th person says, well, who in the hell calls anymore? Everybody texts So, you know, we kind of still from the old thing, we talk to each other. And I think that's what it's all about. You know what I mean? When you make that contact and you talk with people and, hey, you know, so-and-so is back in the hospital. Okay, you know, you go. So then you go over there and you see them, you know, and that's what it is. You know, social media is fine to put some things out there and letting people know. But, you know, the older guys, I mean, that's just the way we still communicate, you know, just through just whatever. But so they're good bonds. I mean, you know, they're, they're good people. They're the guys that I came through. And some of these younger guys, it's just hard to see that. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you know, you, you know, you, if there's a few that are the, uh, the option that are different, you know what I mean? Compared to other people. So, you know, I mean, you call them, call them, they don't answer and you text them, whatever, and then they'll, they'll text you back two days later. <laughs> you know, I just don't get it, but I don't know, maybe society. What would you like to say to a, any man wanting to petition a lodge for membership? If you want to petition the lodge for masonry, just don't petition it to petition or to say you're a Mason. If you're going to join this fraternity, which is an old and ancient fraternity, believe in it. Believe in what it does. Believe in what it's telling you. And follow those principles. If not, you're just wasting your time. And you will see those people then, within five to six years, won't be around. They just won't. Because they're going to see that they're so much involved that, the, you know, that they didn't realize it was all of this. You know what I mean? And, hey, I didn't involve this, 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 and that, and then they don't make the commit, then they don't want to pay their dues and stuff, and then you just, well, I personally, you don't see them, and, and I've seen that going on a lot lately. You know, I've seen guys that don't pay their dues, they've only been in a fraternity, you know, five, six, seven years, and they ain't paid their dues in three or four years, really? Why? Why did they join then? You know, and I'm talking, they're in their 30s, so why'd you join? You know, I joined when I was 21, I was still in it. You know, and there was hard times, you know, and there's some hard economic times, you know, and the deuce thing come in, and I just write the secretary a letter, say, hey, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm out of work, blah, 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 I can't afford to pay my dues. And I said, if you want to throw me out, I says, I understand, do what you got to do. And, you know, they remitted my dues. So they took care of it, you know, and that's all you got to do. But some of these other guys, when you hear, you know, on your deuce thing, you know, trying to make contact, you know, send him this, send him that, he's not getting back with me. Well, then it's obvious you don't want to be there. 
if you don't make the effort, you know, back then I didn't, you know, you wrote stuff, you know, so you sent it in the mail, and I sent it to the, to, back then to the lodge, and the secretary got in, you know, the next meeting, next month, whatever, I got my dues card and said, hey, don't worry about it, just let us know, and you know, if you get back to work or not, that's all, for next year. So, you know, that, and that's what it should be about, helping, helping people out, it's not all about the money, but I'm just saying, when you got guys that don't care, you know, you are not going to see them around if they think, oh, I'm going to be a mason, I'm going to be a mason, you know, and be a mason for what? You know, probably 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago, yeah, it was very prestigious. But now, you know, I think it, it because of the caliber of people in it, it's really not as prestigious as what it once was, you know, so. I have another side question about that. <clears throat> and then, do you think uh, there needs to be any more responsibility on the, uh, uh, whether it's the mentor or whoever is receiving the petitioner and interviewing them, to kind of give them a bit more of that uh, that outlook and what the future could hold. Do they know what they're getting into? Because, I mean, there's so much you can't say that it might be difficult for people to understand what they're getting themselves into and what lies ahead. Well, you know, I'm, and Masonry, let's be realistic. Masonry, you can you can tell them anything about Masonry except the, 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 the passwords and the grips. Seriously. So you can tell them what it's about. That's fine. But when, once they want to come into it and get into it, and then once they see... And then, you know, what are you going to see when they, you know, for three degrees and then you don't see them no more? So, I mean, it's it's an individual thing. It's just like the old saying, you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. So you can, they come into masonry, you can teach them to snap, and from there they do what they own, their own thing. Now, if they just want to be a dues-paying member, that's fine. But when they don't pay their dues and stuff, whatever, that they didn't, you know, they didn't, I guess it was more than what they thought, and they were more overwhelmed than, oh, God, you know, this and this and that, and, you know, I'm not going to do this, and, you know, I thought it was going to benefit me here, or I thought it was going to benefit me for a job, or or this or that, and, you know, and it, it's, just, it's what it's not about. You know what I mean? So when you came in, they came in under false pretenses of themselves, you know. The three more. So we got to meet some guys at six. All right, let's see. Well, we need to talk about that. We already kind of talked about that one. I'm interested to see what you say about this. Uh, what do you think about the public's opinion on Freemasonry? Like, what do you? Uh, how do you think it is perceived, and what would you like it to be perceived? I think the public opinion now. I don't think the public even knows what Masonry is about. Knows or does not know? Doesn't know. Not like it was years ago. Like I said, years ago when it was very prestigious, and when you had how many members? You know, Garfield right now has. Maybe 200, 180, 190 dues paying members. At one time, Garfield had 12,000 members in this lot. I mean, 1,200. 1,200 members, if not more. McKinley had almost 1,500 members. You know, back in the day, Harbor, when they were in East Chicago. So people knew what it was. Now it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're out there a little bit in the public eye, but you're really not. They know more about the Elks and the Moose and the Eagles than they know about Masonry anymore. Because Masonry now really doesn't go out into the public and really try to sell itself as much. You see what I'm saying? And that's the sad part about it. You know, other than a corn, corn thing like you guys do, they kind of know you guys in Highland. They kind of know them at the fair, Lake Lodge at the fair. And Lake Lodge does things when there, when there's events down in Crown Point the Square. Lake Lodge does do things, but those are lodges that are doing things. You figure how many lodges should be out there do, more doing more stuff. You know what I mean? So, but so I think majority, and I think younger people, like you, or even younger than you, have no perception. Don't even know what masonry is. They really just don't. They think it's a bricklayer. <laughs> really? Hey, what about Freemasonry? What's that? A bricklayer, Mason? <laughs> you know. I mean, that's the sad part about it, but it is what it is. I'm going to read this whole question because I think it needs to be said just to get the whole thing. So, Freemasonry's history is preserved internally through our thorough documentation and established trust among our brethren. But how can outsiders embrace and trust Masons while they're excluded from the fraternity? Well, how do you...
how do you trust the moose if you're not a member? Or the Fraternal Order of Eagles? Or the Lions? Or the Knights of Columbus? You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, every so it's just not masonry. It's all the other organizations that you have to pay dues and you have to go through an initiation thing. How are you, just gonna, how are you not going to perceive them? You know, the Elks, they have their bar in it. Well, you don't get to drink in the bar unless you're a member. You don't get to go to some of their stuff unless you're a member. Now, my nephew is a member of the Highland Elks, so when they have events, I get to go because I'm be through him. You see what I'm saying? But even some of the public, sometimes they'll open like Cinco de Mayo, some of those things will open to the public and I don't come in and stuff like that. But, you know, so, you know, you, you got to go in, you, in, in the Elks. You got to go just like things. They have a thing you fill out and everything. So they're, they're all the same. And, you know, so I don't see see how you can just say it's just Masons, you know, when, when they're all, all these organizations are terminal organizations are the same way, you know. There was a thing called the, uh, well, Knights of Epiphius. The, you know, they're, they're spin off of Masons. They have stations and everything where jewels and all that. And, you know, who knew anything about them? They were very secret. So, you know what I mean? It's just all, you know, there's a lot of organizations like that. <coughs> I'm going to skip the one about the history of the Lodge. Unless you want to discuss anything about either Garfield or McKinley Lodge, do you want to talk about any history of any lodges? I think every lodge, you know, every lodge has its history. Go to Lake Lodge, it's on the wall there, you know. Uh, the Whiting Lodge has its history. Look on the wall, you know. All these lodges have their history. Harbor had their history when they were in East Chicago, you know what I mean, down there in the harbor. You know, I think they all have their 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 identity and and their history, and I think that's nice. I don't. I think they, you know, Lake Lake Lodge and, and Whiting they preserve their history through their memorabilia and everything. I think a lot of these lodges have lost a lot of their archives, and they lost a lot of their history, which is sad. But when lodges move on and move here and there and there, and people don't know where this is at, and then you've got a different group of people. That are running the lodge and they don't know where they well, I don't know where that's it. I don't know. Nobody told me. You see what I'm saying? And that's the sad part. But each each individual lodge has its own identity and its own history, which is really kinda of, kinda of interesting in a way, you know. Is there any uh historical Masonic stories you'd like to share or any kind of No, not really. Okay. You know. Can you detect honesty? This is a good one, especially for you being a former policeman. Sure. You know how to read a person. You read them and detect honesty. You know, you know, if you don't know how to read a person, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, he's a good guy, he's a good guy. But there's something about each, each person that kind of, <laughs> you know, through my ears in law enforcement, you could tell when people are lying. I mean, you know, it's just like, really, you know, I'm not, I'm not stupid, I'm not ignorant and dumb. But, but some people just don't been through that kind of thing in their life, you know what I mean? You can detect it and you can't, you know? I mean, people, oh, hey, this guy's great, this guy's great. Yeah, well, you know what, this and this and that. Well, how do you know that? You know, it's just, it's just, just I think it's just a personal instinct that you get on honesty of people, you know? So. If you can comprehend the past, can you comprehend the future? I don't believe anybody can comprehend the future. Who knows what the future is? The future is we might die within an hour, both of us. The future, and the future is what it is. I mean, you like to set goals and strive for those goals and move on, but I mean, it's, who knows what the future will be? Whoever thought that, uh, you know, that technology would be the way it is? You know what I mean? And, you know, I don't know if you remember, I remember when there was no computer, no, no not a computer, when you had the old computers, when there was no satellite TV. You know, and, and the cell phone, when it was, it didn't have all the stuff, and it was a big old bag phone or a big old brick thing, you know? I mean, you know, who knows what the future is? That's like, you know, you can say what the future masonry is. Who knows? I mean, who really knows? I mean, who knows Who knows what society, what the future brings of any of us, you know? You know, I just, you know, I don't believe anybody. The past is the past, is, is there, because that's already marked in history and whatever. The future is kind of like... You know, unless you're a scientist where you're looking at, at climate change or other things, you can look at the future that way. But as far as what we do in the Mason, I think it's it's really hard to look out 
look out for your future. You could probably look within a for within a uh, maybe a four to six ten year window, maybe not a ten year window of your lodge to see how things are going. But other than that, I don't think it makes me really it's hard to do that. Final question. All right. What have you yet to learn? Oh, well, there's a, there's something to learn every day, my man. You're never too old to learn a masonry. You learn different people. You learn about this. You might find out this guy knows this guy, or this is a family friend of somebody. And and, ma and masonry, if you're talking masonry, there's always it's it's a life learning process every day. It just is, you know. And that's what's nice. Like you and some of the guys you go on, you visit other lodges. Look at what you're learning there. You're learning other people. You're meeting other people. You're you're seeing how other people do ritual. You're seeing how other people that really work hard at what they're doing on the officers and how they put on these degrees compared to the lodges that don't. So so I think that's a learning experience for you or for anybody else. For me, I, I understand that. But for you to say, well, them guys really they can't do nothing. You know what I mean? So it's just that's the learning process. But I think life and life in general itself is a learning learning principle every day. You learn something new. You know, I think I just thought of something. <clears throat> well, I'm big into science and, and astronomy, physics. And I kind of wonder sometimes, or really mostly just now, just kind of popped into my head. I kind of wonder if, like, the, the current human race and the state of the planet is just, uh, I don't know, the whole galaxy kind of learning more. Maybe, maybe this is a way of it learning itself. Everything is based off a lot of fundamentals and rules and chemistry. Those things then evolve into different things. I wonder if it's almost a learning process. Like maybe there's a bit of a sentience where it's just, what else can I learn? What else can I go with this? I don't know, I'm kind of talking like a space cadet a little bit. I'm not stoned, I swear. But uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, Maybe our existence is a way for the platform of the universe to kind of learn more about itself, see what else it can figure out. Because, I mean, you make a song, that person that made that song, had uh, many, many things had to come into effect before that person existed and they joined that band sure. and made that song. Sure. Right. Um, and it goes along with anything people have ever sure. done or ever thought. Right. <clears throat> I don't know. I'll get drunk one night and I'll, I'll tell you what the results well, are of that question. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, no really problem. I appreciate it. it. Glad I could help you out if I could.